Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to see you again. And uh, I'm glad to see you today that uh, we have a distinguished uh, visitor from the University of Illinois, uh, Professor Mosse Matalon, who is uh, visiting us uh, all during uh, this week, interacting uh, with uh, our colleagues uh, throughout Pius University, not only here in Eisner, but also in the Institute of Mathematics uh, for Industry. So this is uh, this uh, visit here is part of our efforts uh, to increase uh, the interaction and the discussion amongst uh, mathematicians and uh, engineers. This is uh, the fusion, as we say, of the disciplines, uh, which is uh, one of the pillars of uh, the WPI program. So, Professor Matalon, uh, his area is in applied mathematics. But uh, from the physics perspective, uh, as uh, it uh, applies to the physical phenomena and specifically in the area of combustion. So, uh, uh, Professor Matalon uh, uh, graduated from the Tel Aviv uh, University and he carried out his uh, graduate work and obtained uh, his PhD degree from Cornell University in 1977. Then uh, he had a lustrous career in the United States uh, and uh, from Cornell University he moved to Polytechnic Institute of New York uh, and uh, eventually he went to Northwestern University which as you know is uh, in Chicago. And then uh, when we heard that at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign we went and extracted him from Chicago and we got him down to Champaign-Urbana where he is since uh, 2007 and he is the leader of the combustion uh, group, the Applied Mathematics uh, group uh, in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, now there, he, because of his accomplishments in life, the College of Engineering uh, elevated him to a caterpillar distinguished professor of engineering. So this is a very distinguished uh, recognition. And uh, of course, uh, his uh, recognition is uh, is, uh, is all over the United States and he is a member of five societies, a fellow member of five, five societies, the American <coughs> Physical Society, the Institute of the Physics, the AIAA, and uh, the Industrial Applied Mathematics and Combustion Institute. He has received uh, many, many awards uh, and because uh, I want to give him the time, I will mention uh, the most recent one in 2017, the Numa Manson Medal of the Institute of Dynamics of Explosions and Reactive <coughs> Systems. Currently, he is the associate editor of the Journal of the Fluid Mechanics, uh, the most prestigious journal in fluids, as we mechanical engineers uh, know. And at the same time, he is the editor-in-chief of combustion theory and uh, modeling. So without further ado, I would like to call Professor Matt along to the podium to where he will talk to us about advances in combustion science. Uh, I think, okay, I have the wrong, <laughs> I'm sorry. Turbulent premix flames hydrodynamic theory. Professor Matt along. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to come here and to address this uh, wonderful audience and uh, for the hospitality during this past few days. So I want to talk to you about the uh, turbulent premix flame from uh, a hydrodynamic theory perspective, and I will explain that in a minute. But before that, let's say that the turbulent flame speed is probably uh, one of the most important properties of a combustible mixture. It uh, described the mean uh, roughly speaking, the mean propagation speed of a premix flame in a turbulent flow field. It has, of course, great uh, practical application. Uh, it allows to determine the mean fuel consumption in a combustor, uh, operating, of course, under turbulent conditions, which are almost ubiquitous to uh, almost all applications. Uh, as I show here, it's pertinent to uh, engines, industrial furnaces, power plant burners, and so on. Uh, uh, turbulence, uh, uh, of course, is favorable for combustion because it uh, promotes mixing uh, and enhances uh, combustion. 
uh, it is also a result due to instabilities that are created in the combustion field uh, due to gas expansion or buoyancy and uh, so it's, it's very relevant. Uh, the picture shown here is uh, taken from uh, the um, experimental group of uh, Professor Law at uh, Princeton. Uh, it shows uh, a spherically expanding flame that can uh, sometimes uh, be purely smooth uh, uh, under laminar condition as it propagates out. It's ignited at the center and propagates out. It could be wrinkled due to flame instabilities and it could be highly turbulent and uh, uh, with you know, strong uh, influences on its surface. Uh, <clears throat> so the outline of the talk is uh, first to start with some introductory remarks about the uh, theory of turbulent uh, flame speed or what is known about it. Uh, and uh, then uh, since the focus will be on the hydrodynamic theory, I would like to describe that. Uh, those of you who listened to my earlier talk today, there will be a little bit of repetition, but not very much. Uh, and I want to emphasize the uh, theory is derived from first uh, principle using asymptotic methods. Uh, is, so it's a physically based model, it's not made up in any way. Uh, in contrast to the theory that I will describe, the common approach to turbulent combustion is uh, either do through RANS uh, or LES, which are methods that require some kind of modeling or some kind of uh, uh, subgrid uh, determination, uh, which is more or less ad hoc, uh, and or DNS, which is the most faithful approach, in other words, solving the full equation in all scales, uh, small and large, but of course it's very uh, computationally expensive and so it's done only under very limited condition or in only small domains. Uh, so and the result that I want to present, present from my theory, it's uh, basically, it will cover a different flame topology, the effect of instabilities on the turbulent flame uh, uh, expression or, or result for the turbulent flame speed and uh, some scaling laws. Uh, it's ongoing work that we are doing, and so it, it's, it's not all uh, in final form. Some of it is, is in steps to be improved and uh, advanced. Uh, the laminar flame speed is very well defined. Uh, it is the speed of a plane of flame propagating into a quiescent mixture under laminar conditions. It is a thermochemical property of a given mixture. Uh, it depends, in other words, on various uh, uh, diffusion properties, on the chemical, like what you see in this expression, the thermal diffusivity, uh, the conductivity, uh, the, the, the probably some missing uh, uh, things because it, won't, it was only taken in a simplified form just to show you the the, the main character of it, it depends on the adiabatic temperature and hence on the heat release and so on. This is the only, uh, by the way, expression, uh, uh, exact or analytical expression that is known for the uh, laminar flame speed, which is only obtained uh, via approximation or through the use of the large activation energy uh, methodology. This is the, essentially the structure of a premix flame. Uh, the temperature rises from the cold temperature to the adiabatic temperature. The fuel, say, is consumed uh, in uh, the reaction zone, which span a relatively thin region <coughs> compared to the uh, uh, preheat zone, which is uh, what we refer to together as the flame thickness. <coughs> uh, now, the first question is, can we really define a turbulent flame speed. Is there a meaning when a flame propagates in a turbulent uh, flow? Is there a meaning for a turbulent flame speed? In fact, one can argue that under some condition it's not possible. Uh, if uh, the 
combustion of the reaction occurred throughout the entire region, then uh, uh, under some condition it's not clear what is the flame speed. But there are, of course, circumstances where it is possible. Uh, for example, uh, what you see here is uh, uh, a weakly perturbed flame and a more highly turbulent flame. Those are experiments taken here actually in Japan by Kobayashi. And uh, they uh, show that those are Bunsen flame, essentially. And they show that the angle that the flame is forming, it's on the average constant, which indicate that uh, that's probably related. To the, the, we know that under laminar condition, the angle is exactly related to the uh, flame speed uh, uh, in some way. So it's clearly true in, in, in turbulent flame as well. Uh, also, it's known that flame in tubes propagate a well-defined distance to a given time, approximately, clearly, and so probably there is some meaning to the turbulent flame speed. Uh, if we go back uh, some years ago, uh, there is a group at Leeds that tried to uh, compile a, a lot of the data. They have gone through 1600 experiments and try to compile them in a graph that show the turbulent flame speed relative to the laminar flame speed. This is often the way that uh, it, it is plotted or presented as a function of the turbulent intensity. And what we see is the measurement uh, or the results are very scattered. Uh, and uh, uh, the next uh, uh, diagram here shows the experiment Again, I've taken the example of Kobayashi experiment that shows some of the properties of uh, these turbulent flame speed, which uh, I want to emphasize here. Uh, one is that uh, uh, the speed increases with increasing the turbulent intensity, as you see here. Uh, but the second uh, thing to note is that the rate that it increases slows down as the intensity increases. And it's something which is known in the literature as the bending effect. In other words, the turbulent speed bend uh, at, some, uh, at some rate uh, of, uh, or at some intensity of turbulence. Um, the first theory probably of uh, uh, turbulent flames go back to the Ampolo in the 1940, uh, I'm going to make a conjecture uh, that there are two types of uh, turbulent flame. One he referred to as a small scale turbulent, where the turbulence or the eddies affect the internal structure of the flame, namely the region where the preheat zone is and the reaction zone. And uh, by analogy to laminar flame, where the flame uh, speed is uh, the square root of the thermal diffusivity divided by some uh, residence time, the time that it takes for a particle, fluid particle to uh, cross the flame, for example. He wrote that the turbulent speed is the turbulent diffusivity uh, divided by the time, the uh, reaction time, and uh, relating thermal diffusivity to uh, intensity and integral scale of the turbulence. Uh, he wrote uh, such uh, an expression, phenomenologically, of course. This is the small-scale turbulence regime. The other uh, regime is the large-scale turbulence, where uh, the flame uh, is essentially uh, thin compared to uh, the smallest turbulence. In other words, the turbulence is usually larger in scale than the flame thickness. And uh, so the flame uh, reacts uh, kinematically to the turbulence. Uh, and this is more really related to the hydrodynamic model that I want to discuss. And uh, so what uh, he argues is uh, uh, if you have a, a, mean, a turbulent flow coming in with uh, some uh, mean velocity st and it uh, retains the turbulent flame uh, statistically at a constant position, then of course st is the turbulent speed, which would be if uh, the flame would propagate uh, against a, uh, a turbulent feed of zero mean, like quiescent in the laminar case. 
and uh, through uh, a, an argument of uh, conservation of mass, he said that since the mass crossing the cross area A uh, is the density of the unburned gas times ST uh, multiplied by the cross area, and that same mass is consumed uh, along the flame surface, which is now uh, consumed at the rate, uh, you see, he assumed that the propagation speed locally is the laminar flame speed. Uh, he wrote that uh, the ratio, therefore, of the turbulent to the laminar flame speed will be the area ratio between the uh, corrugated surface to the, laminar, so, uh, to the cross area A. Then, uh, of course, he wanted to relate that area, which is a very important uh, uh, relation uh, used by the way a lot by experimentalists because it's an easy uh, way to uh, measure uh, areas, uh, area ratio of the turbulent flame. Uh, of, the turbulent flame. Uh, of course, he wanted to relate that to turbulent uh, characteristics, and so uh, he used some analogy to uh, Bunsen burner. Uh, to relate the area ratio to the intensity divided by the laminar flame speed and so uh, presented such a uh, relation for the turbulent speed. So it's proportional to V prime, clearly doesn't have the bending effect in it. Uh, the few years later, uh, Schalken took the Ancola's idea and uh, he improved them. Uh, note that all these are phenomenologically created. And so uh, you wrote that uh, the turbulent speed is uh, the laminar speed times the square root of 1 plus, this is the intensity of the turbulent square. And so you see if you expand this for small intensity, you get a quadratic dependence. In other words, the difference between the turbulent to the laminar flame speed is proportional to the intensity square. And for uh, high intensity, recover the Dan Kohler's idea of ST being proportional to V prime. Uh, an expression similar to this was derived only in the, in the 70s, or actually close to 1980, by Clavin and Williams. Uh, they essentially use a perturbation method of a weakly perturbed planar flame under weakly weak turbulence and so on and uh, uh, were able to derive a similar expression that have this quadratic uh, uh, dependence on uh, the intensity. And uh, the most <coughs> of the results since uh, have used this idea, but have generalized the constant in front of the uh, V prime and uh, the exponent n and uh, either determining them empirically or determining them using some other physical argument, dependence on various uh, properties uh, that you can identify uh, for the flame. So uh, the, uh, the first question that I want to address is uh, the local flame speed that Damkola assumed to be the laminar flame speed, uh, in general circumstances, may not be equal to the laminar flame speed. And uh, uh, so uh, it may depend on the local geometry of the flame or the local curvature and the local flow condition, which is, uh, for example, uh, the strain rate experienced by the flame. Uh, by the way, the flame speed is typically uh, or commonly defined uh, as the propagation speed of the flame towards the unburned gas, clearly, uh, relative to the incoming flow. Okay? Uh, I said commonly because uh, at least, uh, you know, in the, uh, historically, in the Soviet Union, the definition was exactly uh, relative to the burned gas instead of the unburned gas, which creates sometimes some confusion, but it's, uh, it's not too... Uh, too complicated to relate to the two. Uh, the second comment that I want to make here uh, about the flame speed that uh, although one anticipates that the flame speed will depend in general on the local property, such a relation is not known in general. And uh, really the only thing that we do know is a relation for weakly stretched flame. Uh, 
uh, and uh, this is a, a relation obtained by a multi-scale approach that I will uh, mention later uh, in, in, uh, soon in the talk. The next uh, uh, question is, uh, okay, if uh, one assumes such a relation for the uh, turbulent speed, then uh, these numbers can be obtained maybe empirically and so on, but how do they really de depend on heat release, ambient pressure, mixture composition, and so on. So what we want is to uh, uh, find some uh, more physically based theory that can respond to such uh, uh, questions. And uh, the last thing is, what is the mechanism responsible for the bending effect if we can uh, provide some explanation or understanding of that to uh, the theoretical development? So, uh, hydrodynamic theory. What do I mean by the hydrodynamic theory? It's a multi-scale approach that assumes that the flame is thin compared to the uh, large hydrodynamic scale. If those of you familiar, uh, uh, in fluid mechanics it's like treating a boundary layer in, in, in an otherwise uh, uh, inviscid flow. So the boundary layer is the flame and the flow outside is uh, the fluid mechanics that is affected by the flame and is affecting the flame. There is a coupling here between the two. So the model should really have that coupling for it to be a good model. Uh, so the idea is that you resolve the flame that now disappeared. It became an interface that separates the unburned gas with the burned gas. And uh, through matching uh, through the uh, from one end to another, you obtain uh, a relation that relates the uh, unburned gas to the burned gas. Uh, so at the end of the day, you have to solve uh, a fluid dynamical problem with different densities, with an, an interface uh, uh, somewhere in the field, that uh, across which the Rankine-Ungonio or conservation of mass and momentum has to be satisfied, and which propagate at a speed which was derived from that model. It was not imposed or made up. It was derived systematically. And that speed tells you that the flame speed is the laminar flame speed corrected by uh, what we refer to flame stretch. And the coefficient in front is known as the Markstein length because Markstein in the 50s have uh, introduced phenomenologically a relation similar to this doesn't depend on stretch, but depend only on curvature, and since then the theory has been expanded to, to show that it's not only curvature that can affect the flame, but also uh, the strain rate or the stretch. Uh, to explain that relation, I want to tell you a few things quickly about flame stretch and, uh, and Markstein length, but before that let me point out that this uh, relation for the flame speed is equivalent uh, to an evolution equation that tells you how the surface propagates. Psi equal to zero is the surface, so clearly uh, the, this, ex this, ex uh, this equation tells you how psi change uh, uh, position and uh, uh, in time. All right. So uh, the first I will say something about the Markstein lengths. The Markstein lengths is a parameter that they can come from the theory that mimics all the diffusion and reaction processes that occur inside the flame. So it depends on the flame thickness, LF, uh, here. So the marks and lengths have units of lengths, that's why it's called marks and lengths. By the way, it can be also positive and negative. It's not an actual length, it's something that has units of length. Uh, it depends on the thermal expansion, which is the density ratio between the unburned to burn gas, which is the same as the temperature ratio of the burn to the unburned gas, which is essentially the amount of heat that is released uh, during combustion. Uh, it depends on properties of the conductivity and diffusivity. Sometimes they depend strongly on temperature, and that's included here in, the, uh, in this expression. Uh, it depends on the activation energy, it tells you something about the chemical reaction. And they depend on the differential and preferential diffusion or on the effective Lewis number. The Lewis number is the ratio of the thermal diffusivity divided by the mass diffusivity. 
So uh, if uh, uh, it, 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 you see in a flame, uh, heat is conducted or diffused away from the flame, but the fuel is diffusing towards the flame, and these two may compete. And uh, when the Lewis number is greater or less than one, it means that one is more important than the other and vice versa. And uh, just to show you what uh, the Markstein lengths look like, here it is for a propane air mixture. Uh, so it, it was uh, the effective Lewis number, is, it's an expression, was not made up. Again, I mention that because sometimes people think if I say uh, an effective, it means it was somehow created uh, as an effect. No, it was derived systematically uh, in, for two component mixture where we have a fuel and oxidizer. And so uh, the expression that you have to provide to get the effective Lewis number is the Lewis number of the fuel under uh, uh, a lean condition and the fuel number of the oxidizer under rich condition and then the expression connect the two. You note that uh, beta is the activation energy, the activation doesn't affect very much. What changes the Markstein lengths is primarily the equivalence ratio. In other words, moving from uh, lean to rich in, hydro in, in hydrocarbon like propane, the Markstein lengths usually decrease. Uh, in contrast, uh, for hydrogen air, the Markstein lengths increase. So what we uh, usually see, uh, both experimentally and from the theory, that uh, rich hydrocarbon behave like lean hydrogen and, lean, and rich hydrogen behave like uh, uh, lean hydrocarbon. They don't behave in the same way. So this is the Markstein lengths. The next thing is the flame stretch. The flame stretch is uh, the time rate of change of an area of, a, of, of an area element of the flame surface. And for that, uh, a general equation was derived that uh, contained two terms. This is equivalent to this. The first term is the surface dilatation of the uh, moving surface. In other words, the, if a moving surface is curved and the, as the flame propagates, the area increases. Uh, and the second term is due to the velocity field. Uh, it, it, the surface can get extended if the velocity component along the flame surface uh, have gradients that stretch the flame or can, of course, compress the flame depending on the sign. Simple example of the two is uh, a spherically expanding flame is, uh, uh, is exactly what you see here. Vf is r dot, the propagation speed. 2 over R is the curvature, so that's identical to this. Uh, the, the surface extension due to the velocity gradient is what you will see in a flame in a stagnation point flow or in a counter flow where the flame is uh, stretched by the strain. So this is the flame speed flame stretch relation and before I use it to next to discuss my uh, turbulent flame result, I want to make uh, two comments. The first one is uh, that uh, the theory is limited for uh, Markstein lengths positive. The reason for this is because when the Markstein lengths is negative, there are thermodiffusive effects. In other words, it's exactly what I commented before, the competing effect of diffusion of mass and heat that create uh, small-scale instabilities. And the theory so far, uh, the equation uh, the, for the propagation is ill-posed in that limit. So we cannot address this via the hydrodynamic model. So the theory will only be good for rich hydrogen air. And when I say rich, it really from comparison with DNS, uh, it seems like uh, it's even slightly below stoichiometry from 0.9 up. Uh, uh, fall under this category uh, and or lean hydrocarbon air. So in other words, in the absence of any of these thermodiffusive instability, which are very important because of course we want to understand lean hydrogen and we don't have a theory yet for that. Uh, the numerical implementation of the hydrodynamic model is not trivial either. It requires solving the zero Mach number variable density Navier-Stokes equation with an interface that is not uh, known a priori across which the Rankine Nugonio uh, have to be satisfied and uh, of course there is 
an interaction between the flame and the flow via the stretch. And I will not talk about the implementation much, but here is just a summary of the uh, hydrodynamic model. Uh, and uh, just to point out that, first of all, it's a nonlinear problem. It's a free boundary problem. In other words, the interface is an unknown that have to be determined as part of the solution. Uh, the oops in the model, the flame is affected by the flow by thermal expansion. Uh, because the rankine eugonio relation account exactly for this uh, mass uh, conservation that is affected by thermal expansion. And the flow affects the propagation through the flame speed. So it's a fully coupled problem. Okay. Uh, before uh, uh, going to the turbulent case, I just want to show you that uh, at least uh, qualitatively, as what I am interested in, uh, this hydrodynamic model provides uh, results which uh, are as good as uh, or close enough to the uh, result of DNS. And so what I am showing you here uh, is uh, propane air at phi equal to 0.8 equivalence ratio. Since I told you that using all the parameters for propane air I can construct the Markstein length, I calculated the masting length from my formula, and here is the number that I got. The effective Lewis number for phi equal to 0.8 propane air was 1.588. Taking these values, we ran a laminar uh, uh, solution. Uh, this is a flame that propagates steadily. It's as a result of the Darryl Landau instability. It get created with a uh, pointing to a, with a point uh, or a cusp light pointing to uh, the burn gas and the propagation was obtained to be uh, about 24% above the laminar flame speed clearly for the, ex for the larger surface area. Uh, here is the same result, uh, I mean the, the same flame for numerical simulation does DNS okay, for a one step chemistry with the same parameter uh, it was uh, uh, done uh, uh, in, uh, by the group of collaborators at the ETH in, in, in Zurich and uh, you see that the propagation speed is about 1.277 the laminar speed. So it's quite close, sufficiently to learn enough about flame propagation using this model. Of course it has some limitation and I will talk about that as well. So, uh, just to also indicate that the flame shape is very similar, uh, here is the velocity, uh, the color shows the velocity, of course the increase in the velocity is due to the expansion and uh, the gas is moving uh, faster uh, and uh, it, it's quite similar, there's a striking similarity I would say between the two. Alright, so now uh, having this theory I want to first of all uh, uh, revisit Dan Kohler's conjecture. So Dan Kohler argue based on mass uh, argument that uh, the uh, uh, mass flow rate is given by this expression and he equated it to the mass consumed at the uh, surface of the corrugated surface assuming that the flame speed is the laminar flame speed. Well we have a better relation which is the corrected flame speed that have a stretch dependence and since it's a local property then the mean here will have to be the mean of the surface times the area and so this is the relation that uh, show that in addition to uh, a change in area ratio that cause uh, that is caused by the turbulence and affect the turbulence speed there is also some effect associated with the variation of the mean propagation speed or the mean stretch. So the flame being stretched can propagate uh, differently than it would otherwise. Um, uh, just a few comments about flame instability because that will uh, also be uh, important uh, in my result that I will describe uh, soon. Uh, what I'm showing here, it's a very quick uh, uh, 
presentation of the so-called Dario Lando instability, which has been known since the 1940s and a uh, result from the gas expansion. The gas expansion creates hydrodynamic flow that caused the flame to uh, become unstable. And uh, the flame is uh, uh, unstable, usually it's a large scale instability, and uh, the only thing that can stabilize the flame is the fusion effect uh, that stabilizes the short waves. So what we see is that depending on uh, the parameter here that I refer to as the Markstein number, which is the Markstein length but scaled with respect to the domain size, uh, there is a region where the flame that will propagate is the planar flame, and that's the stable flame, uh, and it propagates at a speed essentially 1, right? UL over SL will be 1, and uh, there is a bifurcation point at some value of the Markstein number, where the plane of flame is no longer what nature chooses, but the nature chooses a corrugated structure, uh, similar to what I showed you a minute ago, which is shown here for 2D and shown here in 3D. So the nature, uh, nature uh, showed that the flame uh, for the smaller Markstein number, the, the arrow goes this way, for the smaller Markstein number, uh, is the creation of this sharp cusp uh, pointing towards the burn gas. And uh, these have been observed experimentally. This is a, uh, an inverted flame. It's what we call a V-flame. It's like a Bunsen burner, but it's stabilized at a rod at the center of the burner. So instead of the burner being conical, it gets the inverted shape. And uh, under weakly turbulent uh, condition, you see the creation of these sharp cusps that uh, point towards the burn gas. Um, this is another example of a turbulent flame where uh, you can easily see these uh, uh, sharp fold creases that are formed on the surface. So uh, the simulation that we are going to do, or the numerical calculation that we are going to do, are going to be as follows. Uh, we create a, uh, on the side, or a priori, a turbulent field, and for the time being I'm going to only do two-dimensional simulation, but I will show you something that we are already at the process of doing in, in, in a real three-dimensional situation. So we create a, 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 a turbulent field sufficiently in a large domain, and uh, that turbulent field has some properties. It has an intensity V prime and an integral scale L. And then that, uh, field, uh, that uh, uh, turbulent field is fed uh, at the bottom of, uh, uh, of this domain where we want to study the propagation of the flame. And uh, it's fed at the bottom of the flame propagated against it. And uh, what you see here is uh, just a, uh, an example of a simulation uh, or at one instant where the flame surface is that black curve that can fold and, and so on. And uh, what you see here are vorticity, uh, blue and red, of course, different direction. Uh, and uh, what we do in order to be able to control the flame, uh, we use a, uh, a flow control that retains the flame stationary at some mean location. Uh, and, uh, so, and we can also, in fact, control the intensity of the turbulence at some position close enough to the flame because otherwise due to the decay of turbulence uh, if we measure the intensity at the, at the inlet it's not exactly what the flame is, uh, um, uh, is, uh, is experiencing but uh, all these are details that we could or could not use depending on the circumstances and uh, then we uh, are going to uh, one of the results that I'm interested to talk about is the turbulent speed that we obtain now, if the flame is retained uh, statistically stationary, then of course it's essentially the mean uh, incoming velocity that we are providing, which, uh, in other words, the mean velocity that we are pushing that turbulent flight, uh, that turbulent flow, and all from this other expression. And the result that I'm going to show you show that both give you basically the same results up to some minor numerical. Uh, 
The parameters uh, that uh, are in my hydrodynamic model is only the Marxian length or the Marxian number now, M, the density ratio, which is the amount of heat release, so sigma, and uh, the two uh, parameters that characterize the turbulence, which is the intensity and the, and the scale. Okay, here is uh, the first result that uh, I want to show, uh, which is uh, uh, at the relatively low turbulent intensity uh, uh, with a Mach number uh, 0.08. Uh, note that I called it subcritical condition, and what I mean by this are conditions that are subcritical if the flame was in laminar condition. In other words, I'm going to use the same terminology as uh, the, the stability result for the laminar condition for this turbulent case. Uh, so uh, this is under uh, a low intensity, the plane gently respond to the, to the, uh, to the flow. So, uh, so this is a little higher intensity. What the, in particular, I want you to note that uh, this cusp uh, structure that get uh, created and they are constantly maintained. And uh, so, and, and this is under supercritical condition. So really the, the difference between the two that I have shown you now is uh, due to the Darioline instability. The first one, uh, the flame uh, on the average is like planar. You have a planar brush, uh, which is very similar to what you would have under laminar condition, a planar flame. But uh, uh, in the supercritical, uh, case, the plane of flame is not stable, and the only flame that you will get are these corrugated flame, and under turbulent condition, in, even in weak intensity, they will be created, because a plane of flame cannot be uh, maintained. And uh, you see that they are, this structure are sort of retained up to intensity of about uh, one half. And uh, to uh, see that uh, in more uh, detail, uh, here is the subcritical plane where the brush is nearly planar and what you see here is PDF uh, of the location of the flame and PDF of the curvature. Now the location of the flame is uh, relative to the one half. The PDF is symmetric that show that there is the same likelihood that it will be above and below and uh, similarly with the curvature. The, the symmetry uh, uh, indicate that the brush is more or less planar. Uh, okay, the um, under uh, supercritical condition, what you first do you see that uh, it is the blue curve as opposed to the red. The red was the uh, subcritical or the planar. But what you see is that the PDF uh, doesn't have a symmetric structure because. Uh, the, the peak is highly, it's negatively curved, which is what you see here, uh, and uh, it's more, there is an intrusion towards the burn gas that show the more likelihood on this end. Uh, so the difference in PDF showed different character or different topology of this uh, flame. Now I want to move to a, let's see if I know how to do it like you. Oh to a higher intensity, and now the flame not only <coughs> respond to the, to the turbulent, but also can get folded, and sometimes some pocket get created, as you notice here, now a pocket get created, and it get consumed very quickly, <coughs> and so that's what you will see at a higher intensity. And uh, when you look at the, the uh, different uh, uh, these are, I hope you understood, I didn't emphasize that, but it's a, it's a superposition of many flames of different times to show the flame brush. And so what you see at higher turbulent intensity, there is really no difference between, it's hard to see any difference between subcritical and supercritical. By now, turbulence is the <coughs> dominant effect. So we see that the instability <coughs> Uh, Darwin Lano instability has an influence at low intensity, but at high intensity, turbulent take over. Um, uh, you can see that also in the PDF, 
uh, even though I didn't go sufficiently far, it's quite clear that uh, the green curves are asymmetric compared to the red, but eventually at high intensity both start to be symmetric. Okay, showing that, uh, of course, wider because the flame brush is thicker, but uh, okay. So this is one thing where you can also uh, examine the flame brush thickness by uh, uh, by, by measuring the extent of the PDF, this is the PDF of the flame position, and you see that there is a difference between the subcritical and the supercritical, okay, or the one with the different marks in number. And that, that difference starts to uh, become smaller and smaller at higher intensity. So the Dario Landau, which causes an enhancement in velocity because uh, it, it has a sharper uh, or, or a larger surface area than a planar flame uh, is limited to low intensities. Uh, and uh, this agree also with the, these pictures that, uh, uh, that you see here that I mentioned before that were taken by Kobayashi. Uh, what you see is uh, that uh, uh, I want to compare uh, uh, the, the one on the left and the one on the right, let's say. Uh, the one here is at a low pressure and this is a high pressure. High pressure correspond to co cause a, uh, a, a flame which is thinner. A flame which is thinner means a lower Markstein uh, length. A lower Markstein length means that, uh, uh, which is what I wrote here, Increasing pressure to a low marks in length. Low marks in length, the flame is more uh, unstable, and so you see that these are uh, the the sharp uh, peaks, right? The cusps that are created here, as opposed to here. So this flame is more of the uh, laminar kind, uh, weakly corrugated, as opposed to this, which are what I call the super critical. And uh, there are some also numerical simulations that show uh, similar effects uh, as you go from sub to supercritical. And these are also experiments done in, in Italy uh, by Greta and Troiani, uh, also that show that you see here is the, the surface is more weakly uh, perturbed as opposed to the sharp uh, cusps that are created here. Okay. Uh, now to the turbulent flame speed, the result of our uh, uh, simulation show that uh, it, there is also dependence on the turbulent speed depending on the Markstein lengths. Uh, the black is the subcritical, the blue is what I call supercritical. Now uh, typically people when they uh, uh, measure turbulent speed, they uh, just take the value uh, when uh, the uh, intensity go to zero and they, uh, they, they try to fit it to the point one. But this is not quite correct because uh, it depends if the plane of flame is stable. Uh, under a situation where the plane of flame is not stable, when you reduce the intensity, the flame will never go to a plane of flame. It will go to this Terrier Landau structure and it will go therefore to a speed which is higher than one. And so this is the difference between one uh, curve and another. Uh, an interesting thing that you see in these curves that at low intensity, both behave quadratically, uh, have a, a quadratic dependence on intensity, something that we mentioned earlier by some of the earlier theory. But at higher intensity, oh, so this is the Dari line of enhancement that I mentioned before, but at higher intensity, the exponent is no longer one, uh, is no longer two, but it's sublinear, it's below one, which uh, indicates that there is a slowing down in the turbulent uh, flame speed as you increase the turbulent intensity. Now, uh, on the same, uh, for the same condition, what you've seen before are these two curves. Uh, what I have drawn here is uh, also the area ratio. And you see that the area ratio is quite different than the turbulent speed. And uh, the reason, so the, the, still the area ratio is quadratic and sublinear, but the exponent is different than, uh, uh, than that of the turbulent speed. 
And uh, the idea is that uh, the ratio of the turbulent uh, to the laminar flame speed is not only the area ratio, but it has also a component with the flame stretching. And this flame stretching, uh, we can compute the stretch rate and compute the mean stretch rate. And that's exactly what uh, this uh, is showing here. Uh, the next thing I want to try to explain the nature of the bending effect that is seen. And uh, what I have done here, I've taken uh, just five instances and uh, drawn the flame up almost close to one another. And what you see here, the flame start folding, okay? Then you have a pocket which get created from this section. The pocket shrinks and disappears, right? So this is during these five instances. Uh, here is uh, the five uh, instances that I mentioned and what happened to the uh, turbulent speed and the surface and the surface area. Both increase, of course, as the flame get folded. There's more surface area. But immediately as the pocket is formed and get consumed very rapidly, there is a big drop. And so what we believe is that uh, the leveling of the flame speed or this uh, bending effect is due to the fact that uh, 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 flames in turbulent situation very frequently get folded, create surfaces that get detached. And since we are measuring the turbulent speed of the main surface area, that is getting overall dropped. Uh, it's important to examine the results for a variety of uh, Markstein uh, uh, number, uh, which is, uh, if you want, a different uh, mixture condition uh, or different uh, other conditions that are dictated by uh, the Markstein number. Uh, you see here there are two cases which are subcritical, three cases here which are supercritical, and of course, they vary, uh, the propagation speed will vary, whereas these uh, must tend towards approximately one. Um, of course, these curves are the best fit, so we didn't try to force them to go to one. They go whatever they go to, and that's, of course, due to numerical uh, accuracy and numerical errors. Um, the next thing is, uh, what I'm showing here is that uh, I'm going to attempt to write scaling laws for low intensity and high intensity. Uh, and uh, for low intensity, we see that all the data that we have uh, uh, created for different conditions, they all fit more or less into one curve. And that curve is described by this relation, where there is a quadratic dependence on the intensity, but there is also a factor here due to the stretching. And, uh, of course, that uh, constant A here depends on whether the plane of flame is stable or not. So, under subcritical condition, the constant A is 1, so that uh, in the limit, the turbulent speed goes to the laminar flame speed. And uh, uh, when uh, the condition are supercritical, the velocity goes to this UL, which is the propagation speed that I've shown you in this bifurcation diagram which is higher than the laminar flame speed. And under uh, uh, moderate uh, turbulent intensity, I say moderate because we didn't do calculation uh, to high intensity, and not yet, uh, what we see is that all the data fit uh, into uh, these two expressions for subcritical and supercritical. Note that now in addition to the stretching term, we have included in the uh, ratio of the, uh, I mean, in the intensity here, also the Markstein uh, number. Uh, and that seemed to fit well. All the data for different Markstein number fits into one curve. Uh, for uh, a supercritical condition, the exponent apparently is different, so we have left them separately. Um, now, uh, such a similar curve have been uh, observed uh, experimentally, but of course the range of intensity is different and no attempt is made, is made here to show any quantitative uh, agreement. Uh, but the idea was, uh, was done at Princeton where they had a, a spherically expanding flame and they have seen that uh, the turbulent speed 
as a function of exactly similar parameter as here, but in that case the exponent is half for all condition. U prime over SL is the same as V prime over SL, and this is the Markstein length divided by the uh, uh, size of the sphere, the mean size of the sphere, which is exactly my domain L. So that's the Markstein number. So we see that there is some similarity between the two. There is also some similarity between the data that Kobayashi presented as a function of pressure. Uh, again, I want to remind you that the Markstein number is uh, uh, inversely proportional to the uh, uh, pressure because the amount in length is proportional to the flame thickness. You increase the pressure, you reduce the flame thickness. And so uh, the 1 over m here can be written as P over P naught, the pressure. And uh, you see that our expression show again exponent which are in the same range as the one seen experiment. At least it's something which is related to the experiment. Uh, we have uh, started to do 3D calculation because uh, I mean anyone that uh, that you talk to about turbulence tells you that there is no such thing as 2D turbulence. Admittedly, it's true. Uh, and uh, but nevertheless, some of the results in 2D are quite reasonable. Okay, uh, and uh, of course, one of our interests will be to see how different is 3D from 2D. Something that very rarely people that run simulation do because they like always to get the results of propane air at 0.8 under condition that exactly fit a uh, certain uh, combustor and so on and so forth. Whereas we are driven by understanding the fundamental properties that are beyond the propagation and what we are interested in to see the variety of parameter and how they affect things. Uh, so this is uh, what you see here is the flame surface uh, as it gets uh, distorted by the, by the flow. This, the, what is shown here is vorticity and uh, I think what uh, uh, was uh, selected here is what is known as the Q criterion. In other words, uh, you emphasize certain range of vorticity in, in, the, uh, in the picture. And uh, I have another one that show uh, uh, it doesn't show the surface as I have shown you before, but only the projection on the wall. And the idea was to show you that it also creates this folding, which is hard to see when you see the surface, but it's here it's uh, clearer to see. So uh, I come to the conclusion. Uh, I, um, my results are based on an asymptotic theory. The flame is considered thin, and so all the mixture of uh, all the mixture property are lumped into what I call the Markstein length or the Markstein number. Of course, uh, we don't resolve the flame. In other words, we don't solve the full equation of the flame. We just mimic them by this Markstein length. And therefore, the basic assumption behind the model is that the turbulence is always larger than uh, that flame thickness. Uh, of course, there are situations where turbulence does affect the flame, and uh, those are questions of interest that I don't think that there is any clear resolution in the literature, because that requires doing a very careful DNS, uh, and also requires to do DNS with and without uh, this effect to verify what is and is not important. Uh, but the big advantage of the result is that they are devoid of any turbulence modeling, any ad hoc assumption, any uh, uh, adjustable coefficient and so on, which is very often done in, in turbulence modeling because otherwise it's not possible, clearly. So there is an advantage for such a theory and this is what I wanted to, to show you. Uh, we were able to show result of scaling law that they exhibit trend which are at least similar to what has been observed. Uh, we have seen that the effect due to area ratio, stretch, mixture composition, pressure, all can be studied through this model. Uh, in particular, the influence of the Dario-Landau instability, which I refer to as sub and supercritical, 
uh, uh, were uh, clearly delineated, something that uh, I don't know how else you will do if you just run a simulation. Uh, it's hard clearly to identify when is uh, the Darylando have an effect or does not have an effect. Uh, of course, there is no such thing as stability of a turbulent flame. Stability has a very clear mathematical meaning. You take an equilibrium, you perturb it, and you examine in time whether that equilibrium, uh, uh, go, whether the, the, the evolution go back to the original equilibrium or not. Under turbulent condition, we don't know. But some of these instability apparently have affected the turbulent propagation, and that's what I wanted essentially to show. And uh, people experimentally have tried to identify such things, and so I think that this can help experimentalists in maybe characterizing some of the results. Of course, as I said, the limitation are that uh, missing out the effect of the turbulent on the internal flame structure. And uh, 2D turbulence were so far done for simplicity. We are moving into 3D. I mean, 2D turbulence have, of course, uh, a limitation that uh, uh, turbulent does not decay, but there is an inverse scattering. But uh, I don't think it affects much of the result because you need to run much bigger domain for this to occur. Uh, but it may, of course, affect the uh, range of intensities that I'm referring to, but not qualitatively. It will affect them quantitatively. And finally, uh, the limitation oops, of the uh, Markstein lengths uh, to be positive. This is a limitation of the theory. Uh, I have been responsible possibly for the theory for the positive. Maybe one day there will be a theory that oh, I will extend it. I know what needs to be done, but uh, it's a big job and I'm not sure uh, uh, when and what uh, would be done. Uh, so, um, so this is the, uh, the conclusion of this talk. I want to thank you, of course, for uh, listening to me, for the sec some of you the second time today. Uh, and I want to thank some of my former uh, uh, postdoc and former student, as well as my current student, who have uh, uh, done some of this simulation. And of course, I'll be more than happy to answer any question uh, that you have.